So in this third lecture for Anthropology 202 Human Evolution, we're going to continue to look at contemporary evidence for human evolution. In this particular unit, we're going to look at shared primate morphology and behavior. So in this lecture, we're really looking at something we can call taxonomy. That is how we classify living beings on the, the earth. And you may think, well, what's the relevance, right, of something like taxonomy? Well, it's one of the ways that scientists sort of organize diversity, organize biological diversity. It's one of the ways that they make sense of all the differences and similarities that we see across different kinds of life on, on Earth. If you think about uh, basic sort of scientific classification, you know, you have the species, which many people are familiar with, and species are part of a, a genus, and a genus is part of a family, families are part of orders, and so on, up until we get to the level, the highest levels, right, of kingdom and, and domain. Now, in this particular kind of classification, there is an, an order known as primates, and primates are part of a class known as mammals, and Primates are part of mammals, that particular class, because they share traits with other mammals. And humans are placed in with primates because we share traits with them. These traits, as we looked at in the last lecture, help us understand evolutionary relationships. They help us understand what organisms on Earth are more closely related and those that are not, those that are more further related. So if we think about just the class, you know, mammalia, or mammals, um, there are certain traits that all mammals, and that would include humans and many other ma mammals that you would see here, the tree shrew, uh, we share many fe uh, features or traits. So mammals will have fur or body hair, they have a long gestation period um, with a live birth of young, and they feed their young breast milk, right? They breastfeed. This is actually where the term mammal comes from, right? The, the mammary gland. They are heterodontic, which means that they have different kinds of teeth. So if you're thinking about the teeth of mammals, right? Mammals, their, their teeth are not unified. They don't have all... Um, the same kind of teeth in, in the mouth. They are able to maintain a body temperature, classic kind of trait for, for mammals. And they have, relative to other forms of life, an increased brain size. So that's the class of mammals. And then we can talk about primates. We could talk about other orders, uh, rodentia, uh, a, a related and a fairly closely related order. But because we're exploring human evolution, we are going to focus on an order of mammals known as primates. And as you can see here, primates have a number of different uh, suborders and infraorders and families that we can look at in this, this lecture. But at this point, right, we're going to move beyond mammals to really thinking about primate traits and characteristics. So let's look at some of the traits that are definitive of an organism to be classified right within the primate order. Now, one of the things that we're going to see in primates is that they lack dietary specialization. Um, they are omnivorous. And so they eat a lot of different foods, and you see that represented in their teeth. So that primates have four types of teeth. They have incisors, they have canines, they have premolars, and they have molars. And here you see on the left a chimp, whose teeth are effectively very similar to that of a, a human being. 
And on the right, you see a gorilla whose teeth are actually also very similar to that of a human being, but there are some differences. Some of the molar ridges vary, and then you can see the development, right, of the canines. So we can think about the diet and teeth, teeth and diet, right, as uh, some of the traits in terms of the morphology of the creature, as well as its behavior. And we can also just think, think about the limbs of primates as a shared trait, as well as a behavior such as locomotion. So if we're thinking about these kinds of shared morphology and behavior, all of the primates have five digits on their hands and feet. Uh, and with some exceptions, most have nails on those digits. So like human beings, right, other primates have five digits on their hands and feet, um, as well as nails rather than claws. Uh, they have opposable thumbs and prehensility. So opposable thumbs, right, is this ability for uh, human beings and primates to connect their thumb with the other digits. Prehensility is the idea that we can use that to, to grab. Um, and in the photograph, for example, you see spider monkey that is, in fact, jumping. And having prehensility is very, very important for arboreal creatures that are using jumping as a form of locomotion. It's much easier to like grab on branches and stuff um, with this trait of an opposable thumb and prehensility. Primates have long, relative to other organisms, lumbar spines, and they do have a tendency towards an erect position, an erect posture. And this particular kind of uh, morphology is associated with this behavior of locomotion. And so what we find for primates is they tend towards quadrupedal or bipedal locomotion. So human beings are bipedal, that is, we use two feet for our movement. Um, and that is seen among other primates, although it's not a main form of locomotion for other primates, but it is seen among them. We have brachiation, which is moving from limb to limb in tree or forest cover. We have knuckle walkers who w walk on their hind legs, but also lean with their front arms onto their knuckles. Uh, we have fist walkers, which is kind of the closed fist and the bottom of that fist rather than the knuckles goes onto the, the ground. So they're using their rear legs as well as their uh, fists to walk quadrupedally. And then as we said, we have here as seen in the picture, uh, jumping. Jumping is actually an important uh, locomotion behavior for the, the primates. And for some primates, like spider monkeys, it's one of the central forms of, of locomotion. So we shift towards brain and behavior as a, a trait uh, that we can see across the primate class. Uh, so the brains, as we talked about, are relatively large for primates, for, for mammals generally, and that is true within mammals for primates. So primates tend to have larger brains than many other mammals. Uh, we tend to have vision enhancement, so that primates have more developed vision than other mammals. We have stereoscopic scopic vision, dimensional vision. So primates, one of the traits they have is forward looking eyes. One eye is not on each side of the skull. The eyes are in the front of the skull. They're forward looking and they overlap. Their field of vision overlaps, providing three dimensional um, vision. And what we find is that this uh, vision enhancement that we find in uh, primates is associated with a reduced emphasis on olfaction or reduced emphasis on scent as a form of uh, sense perception. Secondly, we have just a greater dependence on learned behavior. 
Uh, and just recently, actually, I saw in the, the newspaper they were talking about, and this is expanding as we even speak, our understanding of learned behavior um, in the primate class. Uh, we, we know it exists uh, among chimps and, and gorillas, but we're beginning to see it throughout uh, monkey primates as well. And there was just an article in the paper about uh, tourists to Indonesia that often go with cameras and jewelry, kind of high um, value um, items and so on. And at tourist sites in Indonesia, there is the, the Hanuman monkey, a kind of langur. And a recent article was discussing how the particular group around uh, one of the tourist sites in Indonesia has learned how humans value those items. And so to get food from humans, they often will attack and they will take the items of value uh, from humans, and they will not return that until they are presented with food. And this is not something we see in other um, groups. It's uh, specific to a particular tourist area of Indonesia, and it's not something that they have from instinct in their behavior. Uh, it's not hardwired into their biology. It is something that they have, have learned, and that is one of the capacities that we see among primates, a, a kind of definitive trait of primate uh, behavior. And then finally, sociality. So the primates are social creatures. If we were to think about all the life on Earth, not all life is, is social. And one of the definitive traits of the primates is that they are social. Uh, they have different and complex forms of social organization. So we see a lot of different forms of social organization among primates. We have some groups, uh, you'll have one male and multiple females. You'll have some groups where there is a, a one female, but other females as well. You'll have groups that are mixed with both males and females. And then you have groups of uh, monogamous male-female partners. We see a lot of variety and variation when it comes to primate social organization, but it is a trait that's definitive of primates as a, as a class. We not only have a social organization, but we have complex dominance hierarchies. So that primate uh, sociality reflects differences in roles, uh, differences in, in power in the group. So that some members of the group have less power than others. Some in the group will monopolize power over others. And then finally, we see cooperative behaviors such as kin selection, where you will see uh, the primate individuals which will cooperate with kin, let's say uh, along the lines of food sharing. In a particular group, they may choose to share food with uh, their biological siblings, with their direct kin, with their parents and so on. We, we see that in primate sociality and we see altruism. So even among unrelated members of the same group, we see altruism where let's say um, a member of the group has a certain amount of food. They will share that food even if it is um, let's say inadequate for themselves, they'll still share with other members of the group, even who are not kin, altruistic behavior. Some of the traits that we're associating with uh, primates, right, and that we associate with being human as well. So we've been talking about primate classification, right? What is the morphology of primates on the one hand, and what are the behavior of primates on the other? that are traits that define who they are. And we've done that with this order of primates. But if you think back to primate classification, even though we are describing the morphology and behavior of primates, there is internal diversity to the order. And this internal diversity, we can also, just like we were thinking about uh, the similarities and differences of mammals, right, and the similarities and the differences of primates, we can think internally to primates themselves and also classify suborders. So you will see there's two suborders of primates. There's two different groups of primates that share traits and morphology. 
They can all be classified as primates, right? But there are differences. And as we've been discussing, those differences indicate different evolutionary trajectories. Um, uh, different, as we've been speaking in terms of evolutionary theory, descent with modification, heritable descent with modification. And the suborders uh, really do help us understand uh, the evolution of primates and help us to understand our place in the primate order. So we're going to talk a little bit about Strepsorhini and Hoplorhini, these two suborders of primates next. So Strepsorhini are considered to be uh, a primitive suborder of primates. And what does that mean, primitive suborder of primates? It, it means that this particular suborder has maintained more ancestral traits than the other order. So this particular group of primates shares more features with other mammals than do the other suborder. They share traits with other um, orders of mammals, just like they share traits right with the other primates. And so let's think about a few of these in terms of the um, morphology and behavior. Generally speaking, these are the smaller of the primates. The organisms, the species that are classified into this suborder just tend to be in terms of their body size, they tend to be smaller. And we do believe that the uh, original primate ancestor um, about 60 million years ago, uh, would have been smaller. Uh, you know, if we think back, we got about 200 million years to the first mammals, who, if you remember from the reading, uh, that was at the time of the dinosaurs. We have a major cataclysm on the Earth. We have a meteor that wipes out the dinosaurs and opens up the space on Earth for mammalian development. Uh, and it's from 200 million years to about 65 million years before we have any of the very first primates. And those first primates, they don't look like the primates on Earth today. And so this is what we mean by Strepsohini being the primitive suborder, having some of the early traits, right, of the primate order. They're smaller. They actually depend upon scent and olfaction more. And so the morphology of the, the nose here is, is different, right? You have longer snouts and you have that, the wet, right, rhinarium, uh, rather than the, the nostril formation that we find in the other suborder. We see the Strepsorhini likewise marking territory with scent. Uh, their territorial spaces, nesting spaces is, are marked with scent. They have a shorter amount of time of gestation and a shorter time from birth to maturation. Finally, we find uh, more common for the dental morphology for the Strepsorhini to have what is known as a dental comb, and that is the projecting outwards of the lower incisors and the canines that can be used by the, the animal to uh, maintain their bodily hygiene, literally to comb through right their, their fur. That is something that we see among the Strepsorhini primates and what links them closer together. They share that trait, right? And they're, they're um, inheriting it, right, from the earlier primates, right? And the species and classes, right, that came before primates. On the other hand, we have the Haplorhini, and this is where we would place human beings. And the Haplorhini are a different group of primates, different suborder. These tend to be larger bodied. They have uh, differences in the, the skull where the eye orbits are fully enclosed by bone. You have fused mandibles where the mandible structure is more rigid in the chin kind of area. You have a lack of rhinarium in the haplorhini, where you have uh, two different nostril structures that can be found, two different groups of traits for nostril structures. Absolutely larger brains in terms of size when we compare uh, with the Strepsorhini. We have 
better and more developed vision. We have some greater sexual differentiation between males and, and females, longer gestation, longer maturation period, and increased parental care, parental involvement in, in uh, the raising of, of children. And just generally, they tend to be more social. They tend to have more complex social groups. So we've looked at the order of primates and some of the traits associated with it. We've looked at these two main suborders, the Strepsirhini and the Haplerhini. And we want to kind of position human beings vis-a-vis, um, -vis, right, these classifications. And so you will see that the Haplerhini and the Strepsirhini sort of have I independent evolutionary trajectories. Uh, they begin to uh, reproduce uh, in their own groups, and they begin to inherit unique traits they pass on to their offspring, thus creating speciation. And the haplorheni, very early in their development, they develop into what are the tarsiforms, who are most like the strepsirheni, and then they develop the semiforms. And the semiaforms are going to include all of the monkeys of the world, as well as the apes and the humans. Now, the hominoids are the great apes, that is, the apes and humans. That would be the superfamily that we were a part of in the order of primates. And so I thought we would end this lecture by looking at the traits that um, we group apes and humans together with. So the hominoids. Of the primates, the hominoids are largest in body size. Uh, unlike other monkey species, hominoids do not have tails. That is a trait that we find amongst all of the hominoids. In terms of the nose structure, the hominoids have nostrils that point downwards, and that would be true for the hominoids, the uh, gorillas, the chimpanzees and bonobos, and then human beings. All three of these species also have a remarkable adolescence period um, of, of, um, of life. These species, the superfamily of them, also has no distinct breeding season. They can breed at any particular you know, time of the year. They tend to have more complex communication, uh, things like nonverbal communication, gestures, and so on, and calls. Finally, large social groups and complex kinds of nesting sites. Um, all of these traits really are definitive for um, classifying humans with these hominoid superfamily. So in conclusion, right, one of the contemporary forms of evidence of human evolution is in terms of taxonomy. It's in terms of how scientists classify the morphology, the form of organisms on the one hand, and then the behavior on the other. And if we group based on shared traits and behavior, if we group these together, we can think through their evolutionary relationships. By virtue of this kind of work, humans are classified as primates. They are related to monkeys and apes in the infraorder Haplerhini, and with other hominoids such as the gorillas and chimpanzees.